My name is Livia Alexander, and together with my wonderful colleague Ishin Onu, uh, we are delighted to welcome you to a talk with Rosa Nussbaum. Um, Ishin is right here with us. Um, so, as well as Natalie, the executive director of Residency Unlimited. And on behalf of all of us, um, we are delighted to welcome Rosa, who was one of seven artists who participated in Residency Unlimited's um, thematic residency earlier this year, Food Futures. Her work, um, Space Switches, which she will be discussing with us today, is an extension of her participation in this residency and is part of the ongoing exhibition that we currently have on our website, Thinking Food Futures, uh, which you can see at thinkingfoodfutures.org, which is linked to the main RU website, residencyunlimited.org. So multiple ways of finding the wonderful projects that are currently on the site as part of this. Um, Rosa is a German British visual artist who's based in Philadelphia. Um, her work is situated at the intersection of performance, video and sculpture with an emphasis on interactivity and technology. Um, what is evident in Rosa's work, which I especially appreciate is her biting humor and elaborate mise-en-scene, which she creates all from scratch by her self as a result of her very um, intriguing imagination in which she explores questions of history and questions of ideology and power structures with a particular focus on how institutions attempt to normalize the body. Rosa plays with the material of institutional authority and through the lens of gender and immigration. And through all that, she sets out to expose the underlying desires of institutions. Her work has been exhibited internationally, including commissions for Glasgow International in Scotland, um, a solo exhibition Horizon Land at Women and Their Work Gallery in Austin, Texas. She recently completed the residency at Paradise Artist in Residence in Japan, as well as the International Studio Program in Weimar. And if I'm not mistaken, Rosa can mention to you, I believe she's giving an artist talk about the project that she completed as part of that residency next week. Rosa received an M a BFA from, in I'm sorry, a BFA in Fine Art Print and Time-Based Media from Wimbledon College of Arts in London, as well as an MFA in Studio Art from the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. Before we begin, I want to thank um, our sponsor, the Department of Cultural Affairs in New York City that has generously funded um, both the residency and the talk today. I also want to mention that we have available today close captioning and that is available if you look at the bottom of your control panel there's an option for close captioning that you can activate. Um, I also want to mention that this session will be recorded um, and then finally to say that uh, Rosa will be available for questions and answers at the end of the session, but please do not hesitate to post any questions that you have um, in the chat for Rosa to address, address once the presentation is over. So Rosa, without further ado, we are delighted to welcome you. Rosa, Rosa, please show up. Here, yeah, I'm here. Okay, can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? Yay. All right. So um, thank you so much for that like, glorious introduction. I feel super special. Um, I am sorry. I'm just organizing my Zoom to be right. And I'm going to get my speaker notes up so that I can be all together. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the project I've been working on for the last year-ish, not quite, Space Witches um, for Residency Unlimited Food Futures uh, residency and oh, thinking food futures residency and exhibition. Um, it's been an absolute delight getting all the input from all the wonderful people who I got to work with. Um, 
and yeah, the the work is a direct result of um, that time I spent there. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, the closed captions should also be available for Twitch users if you click the link in the comments section. Um, it's an otter.ai link that I've posted. So this uh, talk is being streamed simultaneously on Twitch and on Zoom. So hopefully this is going to work out well for everyone involved. Uh, thanks everyone for joining, especially those of you guys who are um, in Texas and are like conserving battery, but still coming to see me. I really, really, really appreciate it. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a lot of like heady conceptual stuff that went into the work, but I'm also going to talk about <laughs> um, the making of and giving you guys a sense of what it was like to, you know, physically work on this project. Um, a little bit of taste of that coming up. So you, you get the idea. Um, ooh, and again. All right, so my project is called Space Witches. It is a 3JS web installation. If you don't know what that means, that's totally cool. I'm going to show you. Um, let's find OBS and switch on over. Too many tabs. Here we are. Um, switching on over to the game. So this is what you'll see if you went off on your own on the internet and um, wanted to go see and play it. Um, it is a piece of work that um, <laughs> addresses um, issues of land use, issues of gender, um, and domestic labor. Uh, so I'm going to let the primary character, the space witch, introduce herself. You do not remember, but once I came to you in a dream. You must come to the banquet of bitterness. Now you have come and you will hear our tale. Um, so this project took shape because I was trying to think about alternate histories that we could be digging. So, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, over the last year, I think we've all been sort of re-examining the space in the world that we're living in. And um, as part of that, we've been re-examining, at least in America, our relationship to living in a exceedingly colonized place where the histories of racial oppression um, and of gender violence, all these things have actually really incredibly shaped the lands that we're living in. Um, so I wanted to think about what might a future look like that wasn't grounded in those oppressive traditions, but instead looked back at traditions that maybe we haven't uh, thought about that much and that have really been overlooked over the course of recent history. So a tradition and a history that's not colonialist, that's not expansionist, that embraces traditional knowledges and ways of approaching the commons um, and an embodied feminist kind of knowledge. And I started reading about um, witches and the history of witches. So this is a, a, a slide from Silvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch. Um, Federici talks about the uh, relationship between gender and capitalist colonization. Um, and uh, I know no one wants to see a massive slide of text, but I just, it's just, this was like one of those moments where like I had galaxy brain and it made me feel uh, like a lot of things that I've been working on really fell into place. So in this bit, she's talking about the expropriation of European workers from their means of subsistence, pardon in the Middle Ages. So this is a time when um, workers, farmers um, have 
access to the land in what is known as the commons, um, which is land that anyone can access and work together in a community. Um, and that was being taken away um, as a result of, sort of early capitalist impulses. Um, and she really ties this to the transformation of the, the female body and the reproductive system. So she says, this process required the transformation of the body into a work machine, the subjugation of women to the reproduction of the workforce. Most of all, it required the destruction of the power of women, which in Europe, as in America, was achieved for the extermination of witches. And so I know we're not really uh, actively thinking about you know, additional colonization in, in these times, but we, I think the one sort of vestige of that, um, where we still have this sort of colonialist expansionist logic very explicitly is when we talk about um, space travel um, and sort of colonizing the outer reaches of space and space is the final frontier. Um, and, and the sort of logics of space travel are all about uh, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, sort of macho outward expansionist feelings, you know, think Elon Musk. Um, and I wanted to think about what would it have been like if it was actually the logics of magic and of caring that had gotten us into outer space and how that, that journey would have happened. Um, and so this is how I imagined that space flight would be working for witches. Um, so you have a little cauldron on top of the broom and then it shoots out and then you sort of separate the broom and the cauldron and you fly out into outer space. Um, and one thing that was really important to me to think about was also how a journey into something that is outside of yourself is at the same time a journey that is into yourself and into your own sort of ideologies and thoughts about yourself. So instead of the witch burnings having killed the witches, I was thinking, um, you could have had a fire uh, that looked like it was burning the witch, but actually the spacecraft was going down into inner space. And so this, I'm gonna explain this idea of inner space as I go into the talk more in a minute, but um, yeah. So I, I was very inspired at the time as well by Afro Afrofuturist um, ideas of sort of utopian ideas of what alternate histories could have come from outer space, like Sun Ra, Space is the Place, and thinking about Larissa Sansour, who, pardon, who is an artist who works with um, political issues and, and time as into outer space things. Um, I was reading a lot about <laughs> space travel at the time because I was reading this uh, biography of this um, astronaut and he was talking about um, being in, uh, living on the ISS for a year. And I think we all think of sort of science things, we think about sort of clean, sterile environments. But um, what I found really sort of attractive about that um, was that <laughs> it's kind of just like pandemic times, like you're completely locked into this space it's super gross. You're breathing recycled air. You know, you're taking your socks off and you've got sort of big clouds of skin flakes coming off you because you're not using your feet. And it's like really the sort of embodied grossness of it. Um, and I was doing some like further research into this and uh, came across these drawings by Konstantin, I'm going to butcher the, uh, Tsikovsky, who is a, um, who is like considered the grandfather of Russian rocket technology. Um, and I think that I didn't really realize how sort of uh, mysticist the origins of, uh, of space flight were. I never really thought about it that way. And it was, it was interesting to see this sort of like validation of this, this thought I, would ha I was having um, come on into that. Um, yeah, here are a couple of sort of more developed sides of what the space which actually looks like. Um, like I was saying, we were all spending a lot of time at home, right, during the pandemic and became much more intimately familiar with the architecture of our own, <laughs> our own houses. Um, and this was made particularly intense by living uh, in Philadelphia in the summer 
um, where COVID was impacting the trash collection schedules. So uh, there was this massive mounds of trash outside. There was uh, roaches everywhere. There were mice everywhere. It was pretty gross. And so um, I, uh, I started kind of identifying with, with these other sort of alien life forms that have suddenly shown up in, in my domestic environment. Um, and this is not from the Space Witches work, but this is a work that I felt like directly led up to um, some of the ideas I've had. I'm really thinking about this idea of being like very passive, being very squishy, and what it would be like to be a kind of verminous creature that's inhabiting the homes that we live in. As a result of this sort of verminous infestation life, um, I ordered some roach traps and I was like, I'm going to get ahead of this. This is not going to happen to me. I ordered roach traps and um, I, uh, I got a notification that they'd arrived. So I went downstairs and there was nothing there. And uh, I looked at my phone. It was like, oh, they've been left with a resident. But none of my neighbors had gotten the roach traps. And so I started thinking, you know, who might have gotten the roach traps? Um, you know, who else is resident in my house? And so I started like, doing more research on cockroaches and, and what their like social life is like. They're actually very um, socially intelligent creatures. I don't know if you knew. Um, but there was a sort of interesting overlap between that and thinking about space travel, which was that uh, one of the, well, the first creature to ever give birth in space um, was a cockroach, uh, Nadezda, which means hope. Um, which, uh, she was launched by the Russian space program, and I started just reading more and more about her. And getting a sense of um, what she what she was about and what she was interested in as like uh, trying to like really emphasize and and take away um, from a sort of anthropocentric uh, view of space travel. Um, and, and how we're seeing the world. And I was thinking, you know, why not follow her as one of my characters alongside the space witch? And I think space witches, or witches in general, have like this particular relationship with things that are disgusting and things that are <clears throat> of the animal kingdom as well. So sort of like creepy crawlies, that's a classic like witch thing. Um, and it's imagining what that would look like uh, with Nadezda, pardon me. Um, Cock ass. Oh, what was that? Startling. Oh, Twitch. What a joy. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, where was I? Space flight. Um, yeah. So, I was uh, Nadezda, cockroach. Yes. Um, so I was thinking about what it would be like to fly out with all of your relatives and your family into space um, and that they're really the, the first sort of alien alien life forms to live on Earth and cockro cockroaches are super alien. And I was trying to sort of think about inhabiting um, that particular perspective um, and I built myself a little space suit and, and brought that in and um, modeled that into the cockroach costume. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, the first sort of iteration of the Cockroach and Adesda's narrative in the game. Ooh. The ear of a man who lived in the Voronezh Oblast of the Russian Federation. I lived in the ear with my family five of us children and our father. It was a good home, small, cramped even, but warm and full of harmony. Yeah. 
I've always been interested in domesticity um, and work that happens in the home um, and what that can look like in bringing that into an art and exhibition format. So this is a slide um, that I found while I was doing, looking back at older work um, to, to make this uh, talk. And this is uh, a friend's bathroom. So uh, it's a show I had in a friend's bathroom. It's a really, it was a really personal show. I showed drawings from my sketchbook and a couple of videos that I'd made that had explored the idea of domesticity and the home. Um, and along that, uh, along those lines, <laughs> Um, at the time, I also found this is it, it was just it was just fascinating going back through old sketchbooks, you know, and you think you have new ideas. And then it turns out you actually just had one idea like 10 years ago. And that's the one you've been running with all this time. So uh, this is a, a based on an older drawing of the zombie mouse that I made at the time. Um, I'd found a dead mouse in my attic um, and I was trying to think like mice would be the uh, the perfect sort of narrators of what it means to have a home and be in a home because they know so much more about it and its body. Um, so I'm going to let the uh, zombie mouse introduce herself and then talk a little bit more about domesticity in the home. Ooh. Game view, that's what I want. We are the queen of the zombie mice. You may not know us, but we have been there always. Always you have been sharing your food, your kitchen, your interior with us. You are not sealed in the egg of your house. This is, yeah, the zombie mouse. Um, let me just find my slides. There we are. Um, yeah. So, so her her whole she she was supposed to start off as just like a regular a regular zombie mouse, but as I was making her costume, she became more and more regal. Um, and and in order, I think, to speak for all of the zombie mice, she became she became the queen thereof. Um, and so a lot of this thinking that's gone into this project has been very directly linked to the work I did earlier on this year, uh, well, last year, 2020, in January with my collaborator, Kevin Brophy. So um, it was actually all like closely based on this book by Carolyn Corrado Perez called Invisible Women. Um, in the book, she lays out how the fundamental biases we hold uh, influence design, architecture, and urban planning. So from the radial arrangement of public transport to the literal bricks that we use to build houses with, um, those things have systematically designed out caregivers, have systematically designed out women. Um, and so this is, a, this is a, a print piece where we're looking at the, um, the average female hand size in relation to brick size and how that causes uh, wrist strain, excessive wrist strain in manual laborers. And so uh, <laughs> we put the show up three days before COVID lockdown. So that didn't um, that didn't last very long, but so I'm very excited to be able to talk about it a little bit here because it really very directly led into the Space Witch project. Um, so, so this is uh, in, in the book, Creative Perez talks about how really all of our Western architectural systems are uh, really based on this imaginary male Vitruvian body. So like the height of windows, the height of mirrors, all these sort of things um, are, 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 are subtly gendered in this and ableist and racist in all, in all kinds of ways. Um, but the real sort of realization that that was very exciting for both of us, for Kevin and me, I think, was that there is this really interesting tradition of material feminist architecture um, and sort of utopianism um, that, that I didn't know anything about and that there's all these like city plans and um, plans for houses that 
uh, actually like phys like are, are like conceptually so interesting because they bring out domestic labor. I know I know if you're looking at these plans right now, you can't necessarily see it, but they bring in domestic labor out into the public space. So um, you can see in this like Marie um, Howland design for kitchenless houses. There's like four kitchenless houses around the edge, and then there's a kitchen that's communalized in the center. So this idea that um, there is a tension uh, between this invisibility of domestic labor and uh, real like egalitarian societies, and that that can be addressed in a design context is so fascinating to me. Um, and that's why some of, so this is a, um, the pattern that we made based on, on this research um, that became part of this hyper-technologized boudoir. Uh, that we made and this sort of world fair style presentation. But that research actually directly led back into um, what I was thinking about specifically with the zombie mouse. Um, so you can you can see her here like lying <laughs> caught in the kitchen, but and I'm, I'm thinking about that in the kitchen this house, but but I actually physically incorporated the patterns that we were using in this uh, new piece. And um, I'm just going to play you one more clip from the zombie mouse. Uh, to give you this idea of um, how she becomes this narrator of architecture and uh, our relationship to, to housing. Game view, there we are. Now I just need to join you guys there and here we are. Oh. Are an archive, brick and concrete fossils of a dying, calcifying patriarchal order. When we move our bodies through your walls, along your skirting boards, we trace the histories of your gender norms, the annals of oppression. As the isolation of the home increased, and wage labor became accumulated, automated, and specialized, so did reproductive labor become more isolated, more individualized. We were forced out of the commons into inner space, into the interior. Kitchens moved into the home. The home became sealed, interiorized. The means of reproduction became segregated, Suburbanized, drifting farther and farther from the center. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can you can see how she like really is this almost historian where she's talking about the 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 way that the houses that we're actually moving around in are are physically orienting our bodies um, into particular types of behaviors, into particular types of socialization. Here's a note for me to go to the game. Um, and so, so that really like led me into thinking about this like tension between the inner and the outer space, right? The like idea of extracting the, the kitchen out of the house so that the, the, the boundary between inner and outer space could be porous. Um, and uh, also that this could be like kind of a bit disgusting. So, so like the, the apartment that I live in had a bit of a, a leak problem it's a, um, <laughs> that, that I thought was quite witchy, which was, <clears throat> sorry. And also like was actually kind of quite a big inspiration for the project, pardon. Um, which was that it suddenly started growing mushrooms. Um, <laughs> and also going back to thinking about like being contained in a pod and the ISS and how how like uh, physical and gross that is. Um, and so this is this is some footage over the uh, 24 hours that we had a mushroom growing in our house while other people were sort of making more productive things like sourdough. Um, we had this whole sort of umbrella that started expanding. And I thought that that was in some ways kind of a good omen for me becoming a witch, because I think being a witch is also historically speaking about unproductivity, right? It's about saying no to, um, to the impulses of capitalism, um, but also about uh, like one of the reasons that witches were persecuted is that they had control of their own reproductive systems. So 
um, the knowledges that got passed down from generation to generation about the womb, about uh, the functionings of the female reproductive system and, and what herbs and things you could use for that to not produce actively. Um, but one of the reasons that witches got hunted down and burnt. And then I saw this, um, this is another one of those slides, those drawings from the Constantin, Constantine Tsiolkovsky, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> uh, exhibition that uh, a friend was actually showing me, which was great. Um, and I thought, like, this, this is before space travel has happened, right? So he's like ideating about it and I'm thinking about airlocks and, <laughs> And I love this little guy in the bottom right because he's basically like an umbilical, like the, the spaceship is like this womb thing that he's like coming out of that's still attached to. And so I wanted to bring space travel, this idea of outer space and inner space into a continuum with the body and, and even with the mind, sort of, you know, self-reflection. Um, and so that we could expand through caring and inward looking rather than expanding um, outwards in a, in a colonialist expansionist way. Um, and I'm going to play you the last sequence I'm going to play you today, which is, uh, and then we're going to do some making of. Yes. Oh, we're there. Okay, cool. I won't forget to switch the sound on again. Here we go. Um, the last space switch sequence that deals with inner space. Let me show you. Many of us have perished in inner space. We died on your counters and behind your baseboards. Some of us died in outer space. We died in laboratories on Earth and in orbit. Our bodies have stood in for your bodies. Our pain has stood in for your pain. Yet in inner space we became familiar. The analogizing of your body with your home, your cleanliness with its hygiene, has set you at odds with us, diverting us from natural allies to adversaries. You have caused us pain. But we have overcome these divisions. Now we have become familiar. I'll just be one second. Um, ah, here we are. Okay. Um, and yeah, so. The idea was to be able to like physically travel like through the mouth into the gut into the like very literal interiority of the um of the person. Just my note to myself to go to the game. Um, yeah, and so that's the last bit of the game I'm going to show you. I mean, game is also an extreme word. It's 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 a very <laughs> it's a very scripted experience, and I'm I'm actually excited to do more more game work. And I thought I'd just show you a little bit about like the physicality, the things that inspired me of of making the project. Um, so I think for those of you who have seen either Nomi or have seen Shira, you might be getting like an idea of uh, some other <laughs> influences that were coming into the work. So I was really really excited about seeing that something that was so prefigurative and exciting and had such lovely politics and was so fun and I think you know I was living in the house with the gross mushroom coming out of the ceiling and I thought it would be really really joyful and pleasant to be like a space princess um and 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 also have a really like positive energy and I know I know the work is very creepy 
Um, I, I'll talk about that in a second because I do think that domesticity is quite creepy. Um, but I think that there was still like a lot of positive energy that went into making it. Um, uh, another fun thing that happened while I was uh, making the work was that I initially, um, so I, I really like working with foam. I think it's a really like, it's a weird material. It's horrible to wear in the costumes. It gets so hot, but it's really, you can make really delightful shapes and, and you don't have to work with solvents to make them. Um, but, but I was experimenting with this new puffy paint and I initially followed a sort of online recipe. It's very like, crafty, so it's like a kid's recipe. And it, um, it was made with flour. And I mean, as you may have deduced, we may have had a little bit of a mouse problem at the time I was making this work. And uh, apparently it was very delicious as a costume. Um, I wonder if I still have them here. So the little, little booties that I made, you can see how much detail there is in the picture that all got snacked off by mice. So that was a, um, a challenge um, in the work, but also fitted really nicely. So it was also sort of weirdly satisfying. And then I thought I'd just quickly take you through the process because um, of, of bringing these very physical costumes that, by the way, I have here presented. Um, and I can show you more in the Q&A if you like, but uh, of bringing those into a digital space because it was really important to me to have this like very intense materiality in some of the green screen film stuff, but also have these you know 3D characters and stuff that you can see in your home because it's a pandemic and we don't need to like sneeze on each other and it's cool and no one gets COVID. Um, and so uh, the way you do it, or the way I did it, um, is to use photogrammetry, which is a sort of emergent technology where you take a bunch of pictures of a thing and then you put them into a program and it's like, oh, I understand where these pictures were taken from. I'm gonna make you this point cloud out of various images and um, composite those into a 3D model. And you can see that the 3D model is a bit jank, right? Like she's a bit melty <laughs> and her, um, her trap especially got kind of melted down, which is, um, I was actually really lucky that I used the, the method for making the costume that I did because they are so textured. It turns out that that is actually the way to go for having really, really good photograms. And I actually ended up in a bit of hot water with some of, uh, my reflective things that I've made out of where Does my headphone cable reach this far? Yes. Yes. Um, with some of the more reflective things that I had made. Um, so underneath, I know if you can see, maybe you can see it from the inside. This is all recycled, um, like Whole Foods cooling bags. Anyway, uh, just making sure everything's okay. Yes. Whole Foods cooling bags. Yeah. And so, um, I, uh, when the, when the program takes all these pictures, um, it does not, uh, it does not like reflection. Sorry, that was a long way of saying that, but it is not happy if you have reflective materials. Um, and so as you can see, this is all like matte white and what you, what is actually recommended to use if you don't have tons of money is athlete's foot spray. So uh, this has a very particular scent and this is a highly medicated, piece of gear. Also, it's fun to wear them, but I can't see through the screen, so I'm not gonna wear it for the talk. And also I can't really breathe through it, so it's not very practical. Um, yeah, so, so I did a bunch of green screen work with them as well, um, and then was able to combine them in a way that I, I liked. Um, I'm basically coming towards the end of the talk, I think time-wise, yeah, I'm just gonna, got a couple more slides. Um, I just wanted to say that like I work very, very closely from drawings like drawings are like sort of the um, the most of the thing and I, I think a lot of the times I'm like it's all in the drawing. Why don't you understand what I'm going to say what I'm going to make um, and people do not think that this is equivalent to a entirely finished piece of work. Um, so I feel like a lot of my work is just explaining what I drew in the first place, so this is me modeling the. Um, cockroach cauldron spaceship that ends up being the centerpiece of the installation. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I just want to open this up for a QA. and a um, just wanted to read you this little bit that I um, wrote to my friend after I had a studio visit about this work. So I had a studio visit the other day with this artist and she was like, 
when I saw your work, I was like, why would anyone ever make this? I mean, I like it, but why? So if you have that question, you can ask me now. Yay. Okay. And I, if you're asking me in Zoom, I'm going to be repeating your questions because people on Twitch won't be able to hear them. So give me one second to get myself set up and then I will open up for the Q&A. Uh, gonna get you with my webcam in full view. Okay, and back to Zoom. Oh my God, I didn't breathe enough during that talk. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, you, you guys are welcome to like unmute yourself and ask me questions. Rosa, I'm happy to go first. Cool, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so one of the things that always intrigues me, I am actually really clear about why you do the work because to me, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things that really intrigues me about the work is the aspect of disgust. Mm. Because that's something we don't like to take on, especially not in the arts, right? Everything is supposedly pretty or socially committed or some of this, but it's mm. not about disgust. And you are actually embracing it. And you're taking it on as a subject matter. And to me, I, I really find it fascinating. And what I'm kind of intrigued is in the way that you're pushing disgust from the domestic space to the outer space, but then back into what you call the inner space. Um, and I'm kind of curious about how do you feel that notion of disgust changes or shifts between these two between these different registers okay so just for anyone listening on twitch who didn't hear the question um livia was asking about i'm just going to paraphrase uh the notion of disgust um and how it changes um throughout my work so i'm working with different registers of inner and outer space um and how i bring disgust in there um i think uh part of it is like Things that are disgusting are definitely fascinating, but I think they also open up like a, a an entryway, if that makes sense. So if you're like thinking about like Chris Davis' powers of horror, like, oh, that's what I wanted to, I forgot to show you guys. Never mind. Um, I think a lot of the um the video games and the media that I've been attracted to are like quite disgusting and quite horrible. Um, and I think that is because there is a power there that is not um not patriarchally controlled right like like it is things that are of the body um it's not using your sex appeal to get something it is using the gross things but you can make someone go ew and that is is an entry point the same way that um being funny is an entry point so i think humor and disgust are like they're like this right they're close. And I think, um, especially thinking about the Thinking Food Futures context of this, there's like uh, this very fine line um, between the things that we put in our body and that come out of our body that are super beautiful and super attractive and are really disgusting. So I think it's like, it's like teasing out that continuum between um, what is, you know, beautiful on the inside and what is disgusting on the outside and seeing if we can sort of go back and forth between between those feelings. Because I think like, I mean, I've been working with this cockroach image and like they're super gross, right? They're really, really, really gross. But I think that what I've made is quite beautiful, but maybe I've been looking at it for too long. Um, uh, and I think that that tension leads somewhere. I'm sorry, uh, Livia, if I didn't answer that question completely. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I haven't actually been asked about uh, the disgustingness of my work a lot of the time, because it's often also layered under under sweetness. I'm seeing things in the chat as well. Oh, oh so thanks, Denise. <laughs> yeah. I would. Um, I have a question for you. Yes. I have a question in regards to the characters themselves and sort of this place that you put them in. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about them being like behind walls, but you put them obviously like in outer space. So do you see them as like omnipotent? Do you see them as like the same as us? I'm just curious about like where they are like hierarchically in your mind. Um, I mean, I see them as 
us or at least the space which is us and I think what was important to to me in that hierarchical um thinking is is this idea of the being familiar right like like a, a witch has a familiar but that you could be mutually familiar to each other so that that power dynamic might be broken down and that it is not about having something that you can control um obviously we are much more implicated in the power structures at least we like to think that we are um, in terms of controlling the vermin around us but i think you know we we also know that they run our lives to some degree as well does, does that make sense yeah it does um and as far as the environment sorry hmm. about a second um but as far as the environment do you see that also as like um here like or is that outer space very directly to you um the environment of the that they are situated in you mean yes oh no i mean i think i think of um inner and i i, I, don't, I don't know if how literal outer space is i mean i'm generally like an exceedingly literal person especially in my work but i think that i would say that um it's a sort of tardis effect right like that you can travel inwards to yourself and what you find on the inside is much larger than what you could have ever found on the outside. And so that there is this vastness and eeriness that you carry inside of yourself that is effectively outer space. Thank you. Thanks. I also would like to ask yes. you. <clears throat> so thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, first of all. And it was fascinating to witness uh, throughout the residency both your thinking and also production process. Uh, it was a great delight. We, we worked together for months actually, uh, and, and we had hmm. the uh, chance to follow how the work is developing. And I'm particularly fascinated by the multifaceted aspect of the work, not only conceptually, uh, as you presented so well in your presentation, but also materially, how you started working with all these materials and then they turned into like first the haptic elements was very prominent, all these sculptural, sculptural objects that you have produced and of course starting with all those drawings and then transforming them into this digital space, then also this aspect of gaming, but also the very performative aspect that uh, also involving your body, your presence into the work, being the part and uh, letting us to interact with that. And all this transformation uh, continued in such way that uh, I still see it as sort of open-ended. Do you think the work has been completed or would you uh, wish to take this digital space into a physical space together with all these material you created during this uh, process? including the performative uh, as aspect that you would actually have in physical space. Would you um, imagine another step for this project? That's a really interesting question. Also, I, in case I haven't said this like multiple times, um, it has been so wonderful working with you and Livia. And I just, I feel so lucky to have had this sort of overarching long-term project with that much sort of guidance and, and, and help and support throughout and also the wonderful talks you organized and everything, yes. Um, it's funny that you say that. I've actually just been asked by uh, the University of British Columbia to um, be involved in some of their hybrid online and in-person programming um, with this project. <laughs> um, so it's, I mean, obviously in terms of it being finished, I have a bunch of technical things that I want to improve for people's you know, experience and user experience because, um, I was very proud of myself. I coded it all myself. I got some help, but I did. And I was very like, I did a thing because I've been working with, with technology, but I've often been doing that in collaboration with people. Um, and I think in terms of taking things further, I, I think it would be incredibly exciting for me to be, now that I have this like ability to move smoothly between the digital and, and physical space, um, and I feel like more powerful in that way uh, that I can also go further to make more work that is sort of grounded on this work. I would love to do an in-person performance and exhibition. I guess we'll see how that works out, you know, pandemic wise. I think it would be really nice to do it in a domestic setting actually. Um, and maybe even do, you know, live stream events that have that involved. So you can still do it digitally, but um, 
in 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 the home. I yeah, I, I I kind of I'm almost sad that with the work that I made, it didn't quite end up reflecting the physical space that I'm in very much. I, I thought I had to take it out, and I think one thing I've learned is actually that I want to present it and keep it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there, if there are any uh, questions, by the way, you can just feel free to turn on your cameras and simply join uh, to the discussion uh, at this point, I would say. Really nice. oh, hi, Victoria. Did you decide to become a witch? I, I thought initially that um, I was just making a work about witches, but I think I'm a witch now, especially once I got the mushroom. <laughs> Did you say how or just weather? Weather, but I'm interested is like, is it a whole process becoming a witch or do you, can you just decide to be a witch or do you have to go through like a learning process? I think both, right? Like I feel like step one is deciding to become a witch. Um, but I think leaning more, I, I mean, I think a lot of people become witches as they get older, right? Because you kind of take less bullshit from people. You sort of take this crap and then you you become you become more witch-like um and you it's sort of about being more confident in your embodied experience so i think i started becoming a witch a while ago i don't think i'm like through my apprenticeship i'm like in the bit where i'm consciously trying would you want to be a witch i'd consider it for sure <laughs> cool you can join the coven Although they use a lot, that's another thing you mentioned that I think is interesting, which is like, they do use a lot of like animal ingredients. Oh, you want to be a vegan witch? Yeah. <laughs> but you could be like alongside animals. I don't think, I think, I think being, being vegan is pretty witchy in the sense of like uh, solidarity with animals and having familiars. I think that's pretty, pretty in line. And there's like a lot of herb garden things you can do. I think it, it raises an interesting question about the alliances that you're suggesting, right? Between that um, women are going to find easy alliances with um, animals, with vermin, then mm. with patriarchy, which um, I think is an interesting proposition. It's not just, there were male witches as well, and I'm sure they continue to be male witches. But yeah, no, witch, witches against patriarchy is definitely, definitely the vibe, for sure. But I think that that's, to me, again, it's like one of the other questions I have for you, because there's a certain, at least um, visual tension between the kind of like girliness of some of the costumes, right? I'm just looking at the one <laughs> behind you. Yeah. And, you know, it's like pink, it has little hearts, and it's Valentine's mm -hmm. Day kind of thing, right? Yeah. As opposed to the mouse that has these, like, city maps, but yet it's it, it has these, like, playing with gender codes in certain ways that I'm kind of intrigued by. Yeah, I think um, one of those things, I think, and that, that's what I loved about Shira, is I think you don't have to let go of that. I think you still get to, like, be girly and sweet. But like in a good way, in a way that you want, not because you're being like, you know, not because someone's being rude to you and you're making them try to feel good about it. You still get to be loving and caring. Um, it's just that that's also a gross process, you know, and you might end up, you know, wiping someone's bum or eating like burnt rice or something like 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 those those things are all part of the same thing. And it's bizarre to divorce that sweetness from the embodied caringness of it and, and the sort of life and death of things. But I think that's the, exactly part of the question for me. It's like, right, because caring needs to be gender neutral, so to speak, right? Mm. Uh, and how do we introduce that back in? I, I don't, I think I'm thinking about gender neutrality. I, I, I think the way I've been thinking about it is that this is a source of power that is accessible to all genders on, on the spectrum. But, but in the historical context of it being something that has been um, the province of women, whether by choice or not, I don't know if I'm ready to give up on it being a feminized source of power. It's just, it's just not just 
women or female identifying people can have that. It's just you can you can all come and, and share in that and be involved in that. But that doesn't I don't think that means making it neutral. I think it's like very unneutral. Um, yeah, I, I also don't want to keep people. It's been really sweet. And thank you for coming and um, listening to me talk about the thing. And yeah, go check out the site. Use Chrome. You'll have a better experience. Um, yeah, oh, I'm just checking the chat. Oh, someone's telling me about a good book, um, a great book called Witchcraft and the Gay Counterculture. But oh, thank you. I'm going to copy that before the chat gets taken away. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. Yeah, um, and obviously, like, we haven't talked about this that much, but obviously, like, queerness and, and, and gay culture is definitely part of that, that arc of history. Um, thanks for coming. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank so you. We're just perfectly on time, right? We're like just running out. So any kind of last comments, questions, thoughts, ideas, anyone wants to share before we bid our farewells? Excellent. So thank you so much, Rosa, for such a wonderful presentation. And um, I invite you all to come back to future are you talks and uh, we'll stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.